Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips and just a couple of things I'll mention to you before I start talking about everything. The first thing is if you hear noise, there are crews of people on the roof of our building and they've been there for quite some time. I don't know exactly what they're doing. I'm sure it's good work, but they are occasionally noisy. So uh, we're not under siege here at Willis Warm Health. <laughs> The drug companies have not come to attack, just in case you're wondering. And the other thing is behind me are flowers and things of cards I got for my birthday, which was Tuesday. That was a lot of fun. So anyway, um, we'll just get started. So I always start on Tuesday with some announcements. And this is it. Next week is conference. And you need to make your reservations if you're coming. As this conference is shaping up, and this is always the time when I talk to the speakers about their topics and get to know some of them who I don't know very well better, and um, I can't wait to meet these people and hear what they have to say. I am really looking forward to it. So um, don't hear about this on Facebook and read about it in the newsletter the week after. Get your body here to Columbus, Ohio, November 10th through 12th and learn from extraordinary people. And, and if you go to our website, wellnessformhealth.com, you'll see the section called what's new and there's a conference section there that you can click on to get to know the speakers better and find out a little bit more about it you will see that these people are not going to be giving presentations anyplace else in North America anytime soon because they're too busy doing the great work that they do uh, and that's that's what they spend their time on not the speaking circuit so here is the place to see them the second thing is uh, Dr. Bregan is one of our business partners, Peter Bregan in Ithaca, New York. And of course he's coming to the conference. He'll be giving two of the presentations. He's the eminent psychiatrist who has never prescribed drugs and has done a lot of the reform work in psychiatry, which has been much needed. Anyway, we have a course that we've developed called Why and How to Withdraw from Psychiatric Drugs, and we're filming the last of a, of a set of videos that are online uh, lectures and talks with Dr. Bregan that are part of this course. And so if you come to conference, plan to stay an extra day on Monday so you can um, participate in this incredible event. Nobody who has ever spent an extended period of time with Peter Bregan didn't walk away but saying, you know, this was the most incredible experience of my life. And he, he was here earlier this year uh, doing this type of thing. And uh, everybody just spelled at the end like we had been invited to a private conversation with Peter Bregan that went on for four days. And we were the luckiest people on the planet because I don't know that anybody else ever gets to experience something like that. Last but not least, we have water filters. Julie Gardner in my office, who my eminent colleague, um, uh, who, who is uh, the pro solver of all problems. She's the person to give a project to. And we charged her with finding a, um, a water filter that met my specifications, which is not easy to do, but she did. And we have uh, under sink units, countertop units, shower units, whole house units. They take out lead, they take out heavy metals, they take out all kinds of things. This is an incredible water filter. Um, it, it's the one I will have in my house very shortly when they get here this week. So um, if you are interested in water filtration, I mean, I've always felt uncomfortable the last few years where we tell people, you should filter your water. And they'd say, well, what should I get? I don't know. I'll get back to you on that. Well, I'm getting back to you on it. We actually have um, water filters now. So. That's it. That's it for the announcements. All right. So I want to talk about uh, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force's recent posting on cervical cancer screening. Uh, there are a few, very few cancer screening tests that are effective and that actually save lives. And the, by definition, a screening program should reduce the death rate from whatever it is you're screening for. Uh, one of the effective screening programs is, is pap test. Um, it does detect changes in cells that can lead to cervical cancer. And in every area of the world where pap testing has become standard, the death rates from cervical cancer have plummeted. This is what you want to see in a test. Screening for early detection of cervical cancer does work. That's a different story than you hear from me than when I normally talk about screening tests and how useless and harmful they are. The problem with cervical cancer screening here in the United States is the pervasive mentality that is so prevalent in medicine that says, if a little bit of something is good, then more must be better. So in the United States, what this means is we screen more often, we start in an earlier age, we continue to test seniors, and then we add additional tests just to make sure we're not missing anything. Um, these practices inflate the cost of medical care, and they frankly do very little to change the death rate in any meaningful way. 
So in the case of pap tests, more is not better. In the Netherlands, for example, uh, four times, uh, well, in the United States, I should say, four times more pap tests are done on women than in the United States, than in the Netherlands. But there is no difference in the death rate from cervical cancer between the two countries. Furthermore, in the Netherlands, the test starts later. It's only given to women between the ages of 30 and 60. Whereas in the United States, we're starting at age 21, ending at age 65. And there are a whole host of doctors out there who are saying you should start earlier and go later. Well, in 2014, to complicate things a little bit more, the FDA approved a test made by Roche for human papillomavirus or HPV. Now, it is true that HPV is a contributing factor to the development of cervical cancer, but it is not a primary cause. And I want to focus on the, um, the task force's recommendations, so I'll do another video clip at some other time on the causes of cervical cancer, but most adults test positive for antibodies to HPV. And most adults do not develop cervical cancer or any other type of cancer. The infection will clear itself in a matter of a few months for almost everybody. Nonetheless, HPV testing is now recommended by many health professionals in addition to pap tests. We refer to it as co-testing. It has very little value as a co-test uh, with PAP, and there are other articles that are posted in this library, in the Health Briefs Library, um, on this topic, because from 2014 on, when this started becoming aggressively promoted, I've advised against it. Okay, so now we get to the task force. The U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, I think, is trying to rein in some of the excesses in the cervical cancer screening program. Um, they issued a draft recommendation on September 17th, which was to become effective October 17th uh, after a comment period. Here are the recommendations, and they're divided by age group. So asymptomatic women aged 21 to 29 just pap test every three years. Asymptomatic women aged 30 to 65, pap tests combined with HPV co-testing is not recommended. Um, what is recommended is women choose either to be screened with pap test alone every three years or HPV testing alone every five years. Screening is not recommended for women under the age of 21 since cervical cancer is extremely rare in this age group. Screening leads to more harm than benefit in this age group regardless of sexual history. Screening is also not recommended for women older than age 65 who've been previously screened or for women who have had a hysterectomy. Now, some terminology is helpful in understanding the rest of the task force's recommendations. CIN stands for Cervical Intraepithelial Neoplasia, which is graded 1, 2, and 3, 1 being associated with very low risk of developing cervical cancer, 3 is associated with considerably higher risk. So with that in mind, the task force states that HPV is a risk factor for cervical dysplasia and cancer, but the testing for HPV has a very high false positive rate. This results in unnecessary follow-up tests and colposcopy, along with increased anxiety levels. Now, as a side note, this issue of anxiety associated with false positives has been well studied in the mammography uh, debacle as well. And we have very good studies showing that two or three years after a false positive, the level of stress and subsequent anxiety is just about the same as if you were actually told that you had breast cancer. The, the task force notes that co-testing has increased the number of follow-up tests as much as twofold, but it hasn't led to increased detection of CIN3, the more serious form, and invasive cancers as compared to HPV testing alone. In other words, the increased testing just leads to more testing, not a reduction in the detection of, uh, not, uh, not an increase in the detection of um, the stuff you're really trying to find, which is the precancerous lesions and, and um, invasive cancer. I mean, that's the whole reason for doing all of this testing. In terms of what really matters, again, this benchmark that we should be using for every screening program, which is reducing the death rate from cervical cancer, HPV testing every five years in women who are 30 to 65 years old results in a tiny, I'm telling you, barely statistically significant lower mortality rate than screening using PAP tests alone every three years, but it results in a significantly higher incidence of unnecessary follow-up testing than PAP. The task force directly addresses screening frequency, stating that PAP tests more often than every three years or HPV testing more often than every five years offers little benefit but does increase the risk of potential harms. 
And what this, what, what they're talking about here is the treatment of what are called transient lesions that would resolve on their own. Um, again, different topic for a different video clip, but a lot of this, this, these early changes in cells, if, if you do nothing at all, they go away. So you just find more of that kind of thing if you, um, if you test more often. There are risks associated with treatment for cervical dysplasia, which includes cervical incompetence and preterm labor during pregnancy. So um, when you get treatment for these lesions that are most likely harm harmless, uh, there is potential harm. So um, again, we just should be conservative about medical care, much more than we are in this country. Last but not least, and I think this is maybe the most important thing they said, the task force addresses the HPV vaccine. While acknowledging that the CDC recommends routine vaccination for both girls and boys, it states that the effect of the vaccine is currently unknown. You heard that right, unknown. I'm going to read the quote from this. Quote, current trials have not yet provided data on long-term efficacy. Therefore, the possibility that vaccination may, may, might reduce the need for screening with cytology or HPV testing is not established. Given these uncertainties, women who have been vaccinated should continue to be screened as recommended until further evidence accrues. In other words, the HPV vaccine has not yet proven to be helpful in reducing the incidence of cervical cancer. Serious side effects have been reported by thousands of young women and their families as a result of this yet unproven vaccine. And while the task force didn't recommend against the HPV vaccine, I do. Any medical treatment that offers no benefit can only cause harm. So just to conclude, and, I, and, and these are the important points to take home, um, screening starts at 21 and ends at 65 in the United States. We could argue that that's excessive, but I'm not going to make that point here. Um, you can do HPV testing every five years. You can do um, pap test every three. Doing both together, not recommended. The problem with the HPV test is while it may pick up more things, it also leads to significantly more follow-up tests and invasive procedures, some of which are useless and harmful for people who really don't have anything wrong with them. So um, more is not always better. And last but not least, we have an independent group here saying that as of right now, the HPV vaccine is useless. All harm, no benefit. So um, that's my story for today. Uh, as usual, pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it, and I'll be back to you on Thursday with more news.